Salon Kitty tells the true story of a Berlin brothel taken over by the Nazi secret service on the eve of the Second World War. In the world of Tinto Brass's 1973 erotic thriller, sex is a weapon of mass data collection. Kitty, the cabaret-loving madame, is forced to replace her workforce and relocate to a villa in the sticks. The newly trained recruits, pale-skinned and pliant, duly warm the loins of various senior Nazi officials and foreign dignitaries, and the ensuing pillow talk is wiretapped meticulously by SS guards. Margarita, an industrious escort, has a lover in the Luftwaffe, and he's thinking of flying against the Führer. When his private post-coital confession leads to execution, Margarita makes it her mission to play the spies at their own game. You're listening to MoobTube, a treasonous plot against the art house establishment where junior <laughs> officers regularly inform on themselves. Owen, <laughs> did this salacious tale of stealth and sex get a stiff salute from your secret services? <laughs> well, you know, Ralph, it's so wrong, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Oh, that was a beautiful intro, by the way. Oh, really okay. vibing. Um, I don't know. There's, there's a few things. Um, I kind of want to say about this film um, <clears throat> first off it's kind of the way it straddles the crossroads um, uh, of particular kinds of Nazi exploitation films in the 70s and films mm. about sexuality and power and fascism because yeah. it was um, something happened in the psyche of the 70s that mm. people started looking back at the past of World War II and at the Third Reich um, and it couldn't escape the need to look at it in a sort of masochistic way, mm. um, you know. So there's that, and it's its indebtedness to things like Pasolini Salo, uh, which came out like a year a year before. Um, I presume they were they they overlap, you know, quite significantly. Um, so it's hard to say how indebted it is, you know, formally to Salo, but they're they're both chewing the same card, I think. Um, and then you've got other kind of more. I guess we'll talk about it, but more pure Nazi exploitation films um, from Calvini um, and Visconti, and you've got The Damned, um, and you've got The Night Porter, famously, mm. which everyone kind of holds up as like the the ultimate expression of this type of film. Um, and then you've got Tinto Brass, and you've got Salon Kitty, um, which is uh, disturbing and perverse and uh, deranged um, and very camp. I think mm. in a sense of like Sontag's camp, I mm. think, you know, it's this low seriousness about it. Um, and it's actually a film like, despite, you know, it, the the, mark, the the way this film is explained and pushed is that it's a transgressive um, series of like pile up of perversions, um, yeah. you know, but actually buried in all the muff and balls is... <laughs> actually a quite sentimental love film yeah. and a quite normal cinematic narrative of uh, rise and fall literally and figuratively um rise and fall stiffening and softening mm -hmm. um and of revenge so it's actually using cinematic tropes that are quite norm normative um and there's a surface what might be a surface of like porny eroticism which is quite you know pushes the envelope um mm. uh in terms of you know questioning our own arousal hmm. um what so tell me what what do you think happened in the 70s why was like why were people like tinto brass kind of reaching into the collective unconscious of the 70s in the same way cavini was and um other directors and, and pasolini and going okay fascism and sex let's go yeah and it seems significant because i don't think a work like that would be made now no. And I don't think it would be made in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War either. It seems like a taboo broke That's down. living memory. The, for yeah, people, it broke yeah. down and reformed during this period where that was living memory for a lot of people. Um, my memories of The Night Porter, which I watched some of mm. um, a few years ago, I found it too much. It's really dark. I, I found it just really like... And I wasn't, um, there was no arousal mm. in that space even, but whereas Sound Kitty had, had a real let's misbehave. It's very naughty. Naughty. It's very carry yeah, on yeah. almost. It's carry exactly. on. Because yeah. I think there's a sense that 
Salon Kitty ultimately believes in the redemptive possibility of sex, mm. whereas The Night Porter, which is a film for those who haven't seen it, basically about a kind of twisted master slave relationship between a Nazi and an inmate of a, a death camp. Yeah. And, and there's a inherent kind of p- obvious power dynamic there, mm. but it's this actual quite um, this it this relationship, this really toxic relationship becomes. Um, it's post-war they meet again. Post-war they meet again in Vienna when he's working as a night porter, mm. and the relationship is kind of resumed. But we also see the what happened in the past as well. Mm. And it's just quite very ambiguous about um, sex and about what happens. It's very dark. It's very sickly. So when people talk about Nazi exploitation films, they're talking about the night porter, mm. and this film kind of borrows from it because it's like very. It's also like more like Allo Allo. <laughs> but this naughty nighttime allo allo, you know. This would be um, a hell of a double bill because I yeah. feel like Salon Kitty um, predates an awareness of the Holocaust, predates mm. most of the actual Holocaust. Um, whereas Night Porter is very much, it's a, a Night Porter is about trauma mm. um, and draws what felt at the time that I watched it like quite a heavy handed line between yeah. uh, violent oppression and sado masochism yeah like yeah. the kind of abuse yeah. dynamic being needing to be revisited uh in order to feel anything at all yeah that kind of dynamic and it felt like that was sort of being enjoyed but not like empoweringly enjoyed whereas yeah. salon kitty is very empowering it's very like all of the whores are like the most dignified empowered people very autonomous and it's uh, about getting revenge on the yeah, and they the but they of. very they very quickly kind of uh, unite forces, and there's a belief, uh, uh, like I said, in Salon Kitty that like sex, because literally Kitty says this when Kitty, the, the Madame, finds out that her brothel is being used to spy on her clients, she breaks down to Margarita and says, "Sex must be pure, sex mm. must be clean," and she's mm. got this belief that sex, you know, the, what the Nazis are doing are twisting the inherent purity of sex to their own ends, mm. whereas something like the Night Porter or the Damned is saying there's inherently a, a Toxic toxicity and sexual perversion, and all sex leans towards um, all sex leads. It's like batai, you know, all sex leads towards depravity. Right. Um, and there's that kind of thing, and there's also that that Foucauldian idea of like you love the thing that oppresses you, and it sets up that mm. kind of weird dynamic. It was yeah, it's sound kitty. It's like um, there's lots of normal love scenes. Um, the the set even the sec- the Nazi sex, as it were. Uh, sometimes kind of descends into this kind of farcical space, but it's done with a real nod and wink, and it's not really shocking. There's there's scenes where um, Waldenberg, who is the kind of commandant who's overseeing this operation, um, based on a Waldenberg, based on a real character called Waldenberg, uh, who actually did oversee this operation in Nazi Germany. Um, he they're walking down this corridor with these like nazi doctors looking through these portholes of these girls they've just recruited who are kind of being forced to have sex with a variety of um social like disabled malignants. men yeah and like yeah a gypsy uh, a, a jewish man you know all the kind of thing all the all the kind of people that the nazis saw as degenerate mm. um are, you know because obviously they're all on their way to the camps these people they're all way to the, the camps the girls are shown to be uh, you know, can it's about can they destroy their personal identity and subsume themselves for the needs of like the Nazi collective? Yeah. And I think, and there's this scene as you know, he's literally peering in. He's getting this kind of perverse design that he draws. The reason he draws attention to Margarita is because uh, she fights back. She actually knees the a man she's having sex with. She attacks him. Mm. Uh, she's got this absolute abhorrence of him, and he kind of sees her as like this quite like the embodiment of like Nazi aesthetic perfection almost. Um, <laughs> and it's weird because, but there's that and there's nodding winks to uh, Reifenstahl as well, like Olympia and Triumph of the Will, because, you know, there's at the, the beginning of the film, they have just selected these women and they do these trials basically. And it's big auditorium, girls will line up. Um, they're asked to strip you know, they're all dressed in like SS uniforms. You mm-hmm. know, they're asked to remove their clothes, kamaraden, and then there's a group of men, and there's this basically orchestrated fucking, which is like very Olympic and very s- staged and posed. As a side note, there yeah. is an amazing continuity error that you Go may on. have noticed, where um, a sh- where a man in the foreground has like the makings of an erection, and yeah. it cuts to at the other side of the 
room where the women are lined up and then it cuts immediately back and his erection is gone <laughs> I didn't notice that. And quicker than... Well, it tells you what you need to know about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it tells you to know what you my, are. My um, wandering eyes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I... Yeah, it's just... It's it's so pretty. Funny. It's kind of character, though, because that, that whole scene, there's a lot of... This film is kind of, like, choreographed, but also quite sloppy um, in lots of ways. And there's a kind of... There's, like, a DIY cheap porno aesthetic to a lot mm. of this film in the way it's done. Um and yeah, they have this scene, they line up and they have this orchestrated fucking, but it crucially, it's, it's fucking without penetration. It's fucking without coming. There's, um, it, now, is that because of them not, that not being really an okay thing to oh, film? Oh, almost certainly. But also they like don't realise they would be. They would be, you know, mm. but I think maybe Brass, maybe I'm over-reading it, uh, which is always a risk with this podcast, but uh, maybe I felt that Brass was also making a point because I think what this film does really well is it critiques and sends up um, Nazi ideology and hypocrisy at the heart of Nazi mm-hmm. ide- ideology because Nazi ideology was about, you know, purity, mm-hmm. hom- homogeneity, uh, the classical ideal, um, which is something that's very evident in, you know, Reifenstahl's work and in, you know, Nazi statuary, Nazi, Nazi posters. It was very sexual, but very sexless, you know. Mm. It was the unconsummated sexual tension at the heart of Nazism. So this film... saying does, Nazis were edgelords. edgelords. Yeah, they were the ultimate edges, in a way. Because what this film, you know, it, when you see, like, Nazi rallies and so on, is this, this collective ecstatic whole, and it's, like, the leader who's allowed to come. And mm. that he's, he's the coming. That's the kind of, like, heart of Nazi ideology. So what this film does, by exploring sexual seduction, it shows that like the fascist seduction Mm. is the same thing as sexual seduction um you know it uses this pulls on the same levers and at its heart you know tinted brass is maybe saying that nazis were hypocrites because they had base desires you know we see a lot of the nazi the thing that kind of leads to Waldenberg's downfall is the fact he can't resist kitty uh, mm. Not Kitty. He can't resist Margarita, and he spills his beans and his mm. ejaculate literally to, <laughs> you know, and gives away his plan to kind of uh, kill the Nazi leadership and take over. Mm. He he's got a weakness yeah. at the heart of him, and his weakness is his base human needs and yeah. sexuality. So Kitty, in saying sex is pure, she's right. Everyone has these sexual needs. The Nazis are denying themselves by denying themselves and repressing themselves. They create this ideological splinter at the core of their movement. It's obviously not the Nazis did worse things than that. It's not like Tinta Brass is going, they're hypocrites, so, you know, actually that's why it's wrong. <laughs> but I guess sex but, wins out in a certain way. Yeah, right? our base the needs and desires, you know, and it has this, like, bohemian Art Nouveau element to it. Like in trying it. to repress, he ends up, like, undermining himself. Yeah, yeah, he's almost forcing but it. But then that would, that, would, the, that would then lead him to... The, the lesson that one might learn from that is just be better at repressing yeah (laughs) which is i think how this thing often plays out Mm. if we're going to talk like which i think we should about the the politics of sexual repression and fascism which it brings me on to i've got a few reich quotes not the third reich but Uh, but um, wilhelm wilhelm Uh, yeah wilhelm reich is a philosopher that's very important to me because um he operates in a in between fields and manages to piss off uh, everyone on both sides of the um, the Freudians, you know, he was far too much of a Marxist for them, and the Marxists, he was far too uh, far too much of a f- just constantly thinking about sex and sexuality and, <laughs> and psychology. Um, but yeah, I was reading um, the Mass Psychology of Fascism, which is quite a wide ranging book, almost a series of essays exploring different dynamics of. Um, religion mysticism how all of, and fascism and how all of these mm. strong collective ideologies harness the sexual urge and mm. sub- sublimate it into to the collective whole yeah into yeah. the collective whole so it, you know it it explains why monks are celibate you know all that mm. sort of thing like the, the repression and the ascetic denial because that is something that Waldenberg does profess because he he doesn't sleep with kitty's whores Mm. He seemed to kind of deny himself. You know, mm. he's quite. You see him when the, the scene when they're having this kind of search for Olympics. His fingers, his hands, kind of shaking slightly, mm. and he's kind of sweating. He's like, yeah, he's he's trying to repress his sexual needs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But to be powerful, to maintain this power that he has, because he's yeah. in control. He's not, there's almost like he's it's a like, Volso. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, the ultimate Volso. Because yeah. it's so un, it's so un, <laughs> it's so un, it's seen as undignified to be. 
to have sexual needs even to be sexually needy. yeah to be degenerate yeah yeah as what the nazis saw as degenerate anyway yeah so with reich every inhibition of genital gratification intensifies the sadistic impulse Every inhibition of genital gratification inhibits the sadistic. So every time of genital gratification, you know, I don't need to explain that. <laughs> our, you, you forget that our audience are all virgins. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> don't be so unkind. Our, our, <laughs> our audience um, are very attractive people. They, they are fucking very now. Cultured. They, they are fucked actually, to They podcast. fucked and moved to you. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's because we are <laughs> the most sexually liberated <laughs> men you could imagine. Um this brutalized sexuality becomes the prototype for sexuality in general. The man who has been inculcated with mystical or nationalistic ethics mm. is so accessible to political reactionary catchwords such as honor and purity. Because mm. they imply a, yeah, this ascetic denial. And mm. denial is what Voldenberg says to Margarita when he's uh, grooming her for, the, for this job, is that you have to destroy yourself mm. and you have to... Uh, sublimate yourself into the collective whole. It's like, can you do that? Mm. And, and they sublimate your, your your feelings, your empathy, mm. like all of the things that rise up when when Margarita has the conversation with the Luftwaffe pilot, yep. and in like uh, tries to understand him. You know, that's yeah. this moment of downfall and vulnerability because he expresses himself and he's caught out. Not because she lies for him actually in her own reports, but the the bug in the room yeah. tells the real truth. Mm. Um, and it's kind of like, because that's why, because we were talking about Sontag before, and there's, uh, you know, Sontag wrote that really good in-depth um, article called Fascinating Fascism, which is really good. Right, I've read it. Um, and there's a bit where she's talking about um, the Reifenstahl, but kind of fascist aesthetics more generally. But she says, fascist aesthetics um, show a preoccupation with situations of control, submissive behavior, extravagant effort, and the endurance of pain. They endorse two seemingly opposite states, egomania and servitude. The relations of domination and enslavement take the form of a characteristic pageantry, the massing of groups of people, the turning of people into things, the multiplication or replication of things, and the grouping of people things around an all-powerful hypnotic leader figure or force. The fascist dramaturgy centers on the orgiastic transactions between mighty forces and their puppets, uniformly garbed and shown in ever-swelling numbers. Its choreography alternates between ceaseless motion and a congealed static virile posing. Fascist art glorifies surrender. It exalts mind mindlessness. It glamorizes death. And I think gain has this interesting dynamic between, yeah, between seduction, purity, um, the wholesomeness of Nazi of the Nazi body, mm. if we take it as a kind of uh, in form of embodiment, and the Nazi's obsession with the deranged and the depraved mm. you know because they try and try to reconcile these different things because nazism was deeply obsessed with the occult mm. um and occult uh and it was deeply and a romantic view of nature a romantic review of nature yeah you know and the occult and the mystical and the uncontrollable but also the controlled and the ordered and the civilizational um and films like salam kitty i think are quite good at like sending that up mm. and showing it it's for its ridiculousness there's a really good scene towards the end where um Waldenberg is uh, in his he's, he's in his chambers mm. um and it's his final confrontation with kitty uh not kitty again sorry margaria and he his costume keeps changing mm -hmm. um like we cut back to him and he's in a completely different more absurd kind of <laughs> superman like costume um and there's an element there you know tinta brass is showing the the nazi's obsession with surface aesthetics mm. and seduction and his he's literally there as seductive he's a very handsome e extremely kind of charismatic but dangerous figure Voldemort yeah he's quite clean shaven in every very sense. clean very pure he's actually completely pubicless he has no right. pubic hair, you know, because he's killed at the end of the film by the Nazis. Um, and he's in the bathhouse, obviously, keeping himself mm. pure and clean. He has not a single hair on his body. He's completely hairless, whereas everyone else in the film is this fucking 70s, man. Everyone's like <laughs> really bushy in this film. Mm. Um, and he's not. And it's kind of this interesting thing where he's the ultimate representation of what Nazism was, I suppose. He's like the, the poster boy for the Nazi ideology. Um, and that's what tears him asunder, kind of. I guess, but you're right. It's like that. It's all grounded on. Well, this. He's cucked. He's kind of cucked in a way. He is cucked because all these other people are experiencing pleasure, mm. and he's denied pleasure. He's yeah. trying to experience pleasure, you know, in the in in the mind, in the he? sort of yeah, in the yeah. kind of controlled, 
mm. voyeuristic position rather yeah. than as the, as someone who surrenders to pleasure. Yeah, which is what Ki- Kitty, actually Kitty, um, professes because, you know, she's, as the madame of her brothel, her brothel at the beginning is seen as a like, bohemian um, kind of orgiastic pleasure dome, isn't it? Mm. Like everyone's a bit, not weird looking, but as it, it, you know, multitudes are contained in there. But there's a cabaret vibe. There's quite a queer vibe. Yeah, there's a queer cabaret playing with gender, playing with sexuality. When she performs a number at the beginning, she's literally half dressed as a man and half as a woman. Yeah, she and she's, switched angles. And yeah, it's really, it's really interesting because she's actually passable as both. Yeah. Interesting. We see. I was like, I can't at that point. I was like, I don't actually know. You know. Yeah, it's Ingrid Tulin. Uh, yeah, it's mm. Ingrid Tulin. 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 Yeah, Tulin. Who's in a lot of the Bergman films, including Persona. Yeah. The Thule Society, interesting, was the Nazis' um, occult um, what an amazing segue organization. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> but let's take it back to that because, like, this, yeah, the film is like obsessed with ha- with the seduction techniques of fascism. I think I don't want to over over intellectualize it too much, but that's what I think it is interested mm. in. Um, and when we see various members of the Nazi leadership in their rooms and they're getting their kicks, it's only the Luftwaffe captain who gets his kicks. Normally, he just wants normal tender. He asks, he says to Kitty, "I want." kiss me tenderly mm. he just wants sex pure sex um and these other people are you know i think there's a character who's probably supposed to be goebbels maybe um this kind of like obese general um, oh, the guy with the fluffy muff not the fluff there is him as well <laughs> actually there's the guy who's like uh he wants to shag the girl but he's obviously very repressed so he has to like pr- puts a projector on it projects marching soldiers over her body <laughs> um and then he gets this baked dick he's like it's from the best bakery in Berlin. Oh, you remember yes. he's got a big cock oh. and he basically puts it between the legs and starts like chewing on this pastry <laughs> this sexy pastry which is a horrible it's a horrible looking like it's like um you know this 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 fail bakery um <laughs> cock and he starts biting down on that really aggressively and she starts screaming because she's like he's literally um well he's literally uh it's made kind of, her of her yeah yeah and she's she's being um yeah castrated by castrated him. yeah ritually Drain. castrated it's really weird it's full of like symbology that i think in the hands of like another director um might be more meaningful but here i think it's just to it's just, show it's just porn this is porn yeah yeah i think that's the important thing to forget about this film is that it is just having fun as a rock film it's trying to be transgressive for the sake of it i don't think it's as smart as um night porter or the damned but you know what that's where it retains its quality i think this mm. is a little bit like what we were saying about lolita comparing the two versions of lolita the what the, the when you're dealing with subject matter this hectic yeah uh, politically and, em- and emotionally then you are actually in a much more agile position if you use mm. humor and you use genre and that you go for the more trashy thing that actually is weirdly safer yeah and more engaging then I think Night Porter takes itself far too seriously um, and ends up kind of feeling kind of in the heart, it kind of feels wrong. Whereas Sal and Kitty, mm. um, I was just really turned on through most of Sal and Kitty. <laughs> so I didn't really sort of get yeah, caught yeah, up in the not... political questions of it. And I was, and I don't mean that frivolously, like genuinely mm. like that, because it was a film that's because it was like sex positive as a film. Yeah, yeah, very much. It yeah. meant it made um, which Kavani and and uh, um, and the damned night porter really aren't. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it was yeah because it was positive sex positive and celebrating bodies, even celebrating these old Nazi guards. But it was sort of mm. funny, you know, it was humorous yeah. and yeah, yeah, and playful. Uh, it didn't it didn't trigger feelings of like trauma and discomfort yeah it wasn't trying to make you feel uncomfortable i think in certain mm. parts it was there's a very on the nose scene at the beginning where there's uh, some germans in a uh in a um, abattoir and they're slaughtering like very lustily <laughs> physically slaughtering pigs oh his montage there that's mm. just tinto brass though i watched yeah. some of his other films and he does have like he was clearly like for wanting to be a shock jock yeah wanting yeah. to no but wanting to be like a, an avant-garde collagist you could sort of imagine that he watched Stan Brackage and stuff and that mm. and, or like I imagine Interesting he really enjoyed that. yeah I really I yeah. think he really is like quite similar to Rivette in a way mm. like his the way if you watch the other films by him on movie I can't remember their names now but yeah. they're from like, like late 60s they've got this very 60s atmosphere yeah they're very avant-garde they're quite trash they sort of don't really make much sense narratively they're just sort of quite pedestrian yeah. but they have this kind of urge this editing style that really shows like an urge to play with form and to be mm. kind of be both 
like highbrow and also Campy. bass. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think yeah, it's tried to stra- straddle both. You know, like we said, Night Porter exists purely in exalted plane of the art house. I think, mm. whereas here yeah it's mucky and it's yeah you're right in this this brackage kind of uh, abstract expressionist way almost because there's this scene it's lots of blood uh the light is very vibrant almost like dario argento vibrant in mm. a way like the cut the technicolor of it is quite insane this blood pouring um out of these pigs squealing pigs and there's these men who are kind of laughing and slapping this woman's ass as she's running around you know it's all very <laughs> he's very obviously saying he's, he's trying to be transgressive and he's trying to shock but he's also saying you know that narcissism is is there's a really good essay about his films where they say, you know, it's both the pigsty and the bordello, um, <laughs> which is quite good because it's kind of saying, you know, Nazism was trying to join the dots between base, slobby, dirty, sexy, depravity and mm. and uh, purity, ideological purity. And so he's saying from the, like, from the get go that it's, you know, uh, was hypocritical, which is not like the most damning conviction you could make of Nazism it's a kind of way we critique Nazism now because it's such a remove you know because mm. the the shock of what it was has kind of uh, faded in a lot of ways so we kind of intellectualize it and go oh, now we're going okay it, maybe even in the 70s people were saying well the immediate trauma of the war had passed for not everyone but a lot of people and people were beginning to kind of play with it and discover the greater depths of how it was um, uh, hypocritical and trying to work out its mechanisms and how it works you know because there was you know it was it was a a, a blood cult that mm. was also, also terrified just, of blood and also just making films about sex mm. within that context you know like there are nazi films about lots of different things um and it it feels like this is like you know a lot of a lot of nazi films focus on one particular figure who's who's like a resist who's you know, like There's, Sophie Scholl or like mm, Valkyrie Book. or yeah, like yeah, they're all about sort yeah. of one or two people who had a resistant instinct, which taps into, I guess, our kind of liberal feeling mm. of like, um, well, the war film is passe, you know, war yeah. film has been done to death, you know, there's only so many times, so many times you can see like, um, watch Saving Private Ryan remixed, I suppose. And mm. there's, yeah, there's a lot of films that are kind of talk about the heroic resistance to Nazi occupation um, and there's no heroism in this. No, there's not. Cause there's I just like every, even like, um, uh, what's her face? Margarita. Mm. Like she's, you know, when people, when you do something in life and people say it's brave, mm. usually it's just something that you had no real option, mm. but to do. Yeah. She has no recourse and she's still operating in the machinery. Like the, the way she, uh, the way they do um, Voldenberg in is to use the, the machinery of the Nazi state against him. They mm. they record him making his um, grandiose admittance to his plan. Yeah, and then they real record master's it. tools. Yeah, the master's tools. And then they send the disc to the SS leadership yeah, and yeah. the SS leadership execute him. Um, so she's still, you know, she's still participating. The, the pure character, I suppose, is the, is the captain, you know, Luftwaffe captain who... Um, uh, falls in love and then wants to defect and then is, is executed. Um, whereas Margarita, and I don't think Tinto Brass really cares that that's like some sort of hypocrisy at filmmaking level. I don't think he cares that it's not a heroic film. Um, no, it, it, needn't, no, it needn't be. That's needn't what's good be, about yeah. it is yeah, that yeah. it isn't. Is that it just portrays sexual desire as being the driving force behind a lot of what happens rather than like some kind of abstract moralism like a lot yeah, of a lot yeah, of like yeah. mainstream liberal hollywood films have this idea well, well you know this person was just good you mm. know and therefore he could see that like the, all these things were wrong there's no shades of gray yeah whereas actually yeah. what this film portrays is that people's motivations are often kind of much more personal and complicated yeah much more human like the 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 the, 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 the lift it's really good that you bring up the lift of a captain because his what he does is he falls in love with um Margarita, rookie era, fall in love. With yeah, Erica, and it's really, yeah, yeah. and she's a she's a hooker, and it's um, it's obviously not going to work out, and she's sort of like trying to, you know, fend him, like not, you know, he's not being aggressive. Yeah, she kind of piles him off a bit, but she's like, yeah. you know, mate, like let's not. Let's this is not, how this works. This yeah. is not. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, they obviously have a bond and they care about each other, but she's wanting to make sure that it doesn't go too far, mm. and there's that scene when she's, you know, being visited, uh, when her, her, her new client is 
was in the uh, was in the uh, Luftwaffe. The, what do they call it? The navy, the, not the navy. The Luftwaffe, the air force. Yeah, the, yeah. the air force. Um, with her old lover, and she's like, you know, oh, he, you know, I, I'm, I, he didn't f- fall in love with me for too long. Don't worry, you know. Yeah, she's act, she's acting professional. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, no, I think he did fall in love with you, you know. And then you so mm. suddenly, and then she, he starts quoting back all this stuff about how he was executed for saying this stuff. And she suddenly realizes that the room is tapped and then she kills mm. him. And, um, at, you know, she's so furious and she realizes what's happened. Um, but yeah, that moment, that moment of like real true surrender of like, I'm going to fall in love with this person. And in the moment of falling in love, I'm I'm like going to follow my ambition of like, like, that this 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 moral clarity I've mm. reached about fighting against Hitler, yeah. but it's kind of a delu- in the way that love is a delusion. Also, like his decision to defect is cause of delusion. Oh, it's, it's, it's like such totally a romantic, un- yeah, it's, it's very such romantic an impossible and unstrategic. romantic thing, um, and and foolhardy on so many levels that you tell this complete stranger. But it's kind of the overpowering, um, the death drive of love. Yeah, yeah. and this film is kind of obsessed with that the death drive in a way. Um, as was Nazism, because obviously, you know, to float float a little bit broader, you know, Nazism was founded on um, the Thousand Year Reich that would uh, outlast itself as a ruin. Mm. You know, that's why Speer and Hitler were so obsessed with ruin, ruin value, um, or the theory of ruin value, of ruinvert. Um, you know, the fact that Speer's Berlin was built to look like a ruin mm. that it would become a ruin easily so the ultimate the the kind of the ejaculation of nazism was actually its destruction that at that point it was its defeat a tiny death if you a will. tiny death yeah <laughs> tiny huge le petit more um but it's kind of the the actual program the mission of nazism was complete in that mm. way when it was not you know berlin was bombed to you know dust um because it completed that kind of death drive that's inherent to nazism um but yeah it's it's I mean, the film has all of that stuff and it's very easy to attach it you know because it's a film about nazism it's going to draw up all those associations and as a film itself just as a film yeah it's you're right it is sexy and it's um uh alluring and it's a lot of very beautiful people in it and it's um very flattering and you know even when it's trying to be shocking it's still arousing um yeah. you know it's kind of interesting where it's not it's not hitting the you know it's not hitting the hammer too hard on depravity it's not trying to disgust us yeah. really actually it's kind of funny where it would where another film you know where something like Salo would is disgusts us this film yeah. kind of hum, humors us a bit whereas Salo is very hard to watch even Salo I was a little bit turned on by yeah there's <laughs> yeah there's an element there's an element to it and kind of part of it's like the Salo masochistic thing you know the the slave and the master um, I mean, some people are probably really turned on by Solo. I, I, oh, I say that as if sure. it's like revelatory, but like, yeah, it's all it's all personal, really. But yeah, there's something in there. Yeah, I guess one. Before we wrap up now, but um, one last question I have, I suppose, is: yeah. Is there anything you've seen that's been made recently that mm-hmm. has that same energy, that same ability to be trashy and base? <laughs> Uh, and also insightful and 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 um, that's a really good question and avant garde and something that uses sexual energy and, and arousal to explore um, something quite taboo and complicated. It's an interesting question. I don't know. There's a scene that I watched the other day which I found really interesting, um, and really unrelated, which was a scene in Deadwood. Mm-hmm. Um, never seen it Deadwood is exceptionally good um, there's a scene where one of the characters f- begins to fall for a hooker in this this bar this is America in the 1870s mm-hmm. so wildly different context um, and he uh, arranges to for her to come over to his place he works in a shop and they kind of she offers himself to him in this quite crass way mm-hmm. it's pretty much the first thing she says so he has these very pure um uh, desire, you know, he has this very pure. He he's falling in love with her, and she's, you know, she says, "Do you want a free fuck?" And he says, "Why did you say it like that?" Because she's <laughs> spoiled the romanticism of it, and they end mm. up having sex. He goes to kiss her on the mouth, and she says, um, "This is the ca- character Sol and uh, Trixie, if anyone mm-hmm. watched it." Um, and he, she's like, "If you want to kiss me, kiss me on the neck or the tit." And he's like, "I want to kiss you on the mouth," and she calls him a fool. And they kiss anyway, and it's this kind of like 
it was an interesting parallel of that kind of, you know, uh, Margarita and the captain's relationship. You know, she's trying to fend him off because there's this inherent destructiveness involved in this coupling that pulls mm-hmm. apart. And I think it imply I haven't got that far in Devil yet, <laughs> but I think it implies that this this relationship is also because he, her pimp finds out that they've had sex and he hasn't paid for it and yeah. forces him with threat of violence to pay pay up. Um, so I think that that's somewhere where I saw that dynamic being played out outside of the context of fascism mm. and just a TV, you know, it's just a TV program. What about you? While you were speaking, the only thing that came to mind really was Spring Breakers, mm. which seems to hold that. It's like about late capitalism break, in this really violent way, spring break but it, it's incredibly funny and uh, sort of it, 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 it emotes and moves you while whilst also being mm. very trash. There's lots of Skrillex, there's lots of breasts. In bikinis, and it's very like music video esque. Yeah, like it's inten- mm. insane, insanely horny, insanely like. Um, it's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I forget. It is really good. It's, it's, it's. Yeah, again, it, it kind of is like a Nazi exploitation. It's like a college exploitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it does. It, yeah. That's what I mean. It does yeah. for um, horrible neoliberal American mm. slimy um, consumerism. Yeah. What Salon Kitty does for. Fascism, 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 yeah, yeah. It's interesting you bring it up. Um, exceptional role. For but now him. we have that. Like, thing with that. Well, that was pre-Trump, wasn't it? Spring Breakers. Yeah, pre-Trump. I feel, like, I feel like Trump has made made the job so much more difficult because mm. artists who would hitherto have um, satirized that or gone for that mm. feel this strange obligation to sort of disavow the trashy it does yeah. about the trashy yeah but because Trump has become so, so monstrous and there's this sort of like oh now this is really serious feeling yeah and you have to be there has to be this 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 seriousness about honour and, and the liberal consensus yeah, yeah. it's the uh, what is that new series that's come out on HBO it's the James Comey oh the Comey dramatisation yeah yeah, yeah. yeah yeah and that's but it's very the same much like the guy that did The Wire came out with this thing recently about what would have happened if, if someone had, if the fascist had come to power in yeah and it's in, actually that narrative is revisited it's Man in High Castle it's The, it's the Handmaid's Tale as well. Tale. All these things, and it's like if you don't get Watchmen, it. the new series of Watchmen, does the same thing where it reimagines an America where uh, our current, like the 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 current situation, is kind of um, taken to an extreme. Like neoliberal culture is taken to. But an they're extreme. so self serious. All so, these things so are so self serious. I mean, yeah. I, I haven't seen most of these things, but the Handmaid's Tale, I did watch mm. a bit of, and I was like, fucking hell, this takes itself way too seriously. It doesn't really understand the issues it's talking about. No, and no, it's no, perfect no. bait for people like. Uh, it's wh- white bait. women who think that yeah. like this is fascism it's perfect it's perfect bait for people who want <laughs> like, to like protest they're going to change their twitter avi to a picture of the handmaid uh head you know <laughs> head, like the the cap or whatever and that's their you know we will defy you kind of not our president shit and i think there's a and there's a value in critiquing um, fascism and it's me- you have to understand how fascism works and these things don't they yeah, just take outrage yeah, they're yeah. outraged at it because Trump is isn't really a fascist no exactly That's but you truth. know what I mean any form of right wing behaviour and it's why things like Chris Morris was always such a good the correct um, uh, um, the kind of court jester mm. and it's why his, his satire was so effective is because it simultaneously played in the low the trashy and the mm. um, and the highbrow and the main example now is Eminem like he hasn't done it for a while but like when Trump first got elected he did a bunch of songs kind of dis- mm. like disavowing Trump and sort of mm. making sure to like cl- like because I know that Trump and Eminem did like a video together in like 2004 for MTV I didn't know that it's really funny <laughs> like Trump it, it's, it's actually Eminem right. running for running for president and Trump is like his hype man he's like is it like a is it a music video is no it like no it's like a live video? show right. at MT. it's like a live Eminem thing so and funny. Donald Trump just comes up as the warm up act and he's like Slim Shady is gonna be the greatest president America has ever had <laughs> I'm I'm oh. right. I'm right. I'm oh, Donald fucks. Trump. We I'm always it. right. That's what he says. <laughs> and it's honestly he it's exactly like him doing mm. his rallies now. Yeah. Uh, and then Eminem comes on and does like a really strange cringe thing that probably mm. was more funny then but doesn't work at all now. Yeah. Um and and now Eminem is much older and uh, is kind of doing this he, whole thing of like, you know, you know, orange doing man, quite serious orange man bad. Yeah. It, yeah. And it's yeah. and you get why because he's a working mm. class American mm. guy and he feels the need to like you know to disavow because I think a lot of his fans probably on an emotional level resonate with Trump but that's exactly the problem because Trump emotionally responds to this feeling of like this need for humour this need for release this kind of Mm. well the Trump and Eminem was that you know for the young kids for me even Mm. being middle class Londoner like 
those Eminem songs were like, yes, oh, this song, this person sees the world as it really yep. is with all its darkness and difficulty and like has the balls to like make a joke out of himself to as smile well as to make a joke out crying, of the world. Yeah, you know? exactly. And that's what people need. People yeah, don't I think need people need that. And there's the self seriousness, yeah, like the, the Comey film. Um, what they, they achieve is very little because they make a very small portion of the world. It's it's the, the West Wingification of um, <laughs> the American liberal consensus and the global consensus because ev- the response to uh, the right has to be serious. Mm. Um, I'm not saying we'll be able to take them down, dismantle the, the right through laughter. That's not what anyone's saying, I think. But it represents a failure to address the mechanisms of power. That's why you can't imagine a yeah. film like Salo now um, being made because... It is poisonously dark in terms mm-hmm. of what it says about um, age um, and the old order destroying youth um, through extremely depraved means. Um, I mean, the more seriously, the, the more self seriously we we try and take down the right, the faster they'll take mm-hmm. us down. Yep. Peace. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs> On that uh, really um, uh, op- optimistic ending. I think um, it's optimistic because we've found some catharsis. We found a bit of catharsis. We, we recommend Salon Kitty because it is fun. Maybe it's a, a double act with The Night Porter. Maybe even Cabaret if you want to do a, a trilogy. Yeah, I'd prefer see. to watch it with Cabaret than The mm. Night Porter. Yeah, get, get, get a good supply of tissues. Um, yeah, for the tears <laughs> and for the ejaculate, that was um, um, it's great and also watch more erotica actually I was watching mm. some erotica this morning just some stuff I found on Karagaga like erotica is a, a really overlooked you know when I was like a teenager I just watched pornography and mm. then I watched art house well, it's very accessible but erotica is this really interesting kind of mm. like it has a very the, the drives and the purpose are very abs- very like blunt but mm. like there's so much more room for like imagination and mm. and um and seduction and s- things are much more like weird, which I like. Well, often in in a lot of uh, contemporary media, you know, sex is a. It's expected that if you're watching a drama or a film, there will be a sex scene, the sex scene one or two, and it's mm. used to mo- to to kind of move the plot along. Whereas if erotica, the sex is the plot. Yeah. And so it's actually kind of refocuses the lens slightly, and it's what you see with Salon Kitty. So making sex the plot um, actually becomes a really handy. Uh, dismantling of Nazi ideology and fascist seduction in a space of an hour and 40 minutes. It mm-hmm. does the work of like entire seasons, you know, um, you know, entire HBO productions that are designed <laughs> to show how bad the Germans were. This is yeah. uh, actually really handily does it in an hour and a half and, you know, hour and 40 minutes. And afterwards I was sitting there like thumbing through Susan Sontag and looking at Nightport and stuff. It's much better board springboard to explore how fascism works. Mm. I think that's my take. Cause it on doesn't it. deny the erotic. It doesn't deny the erotic. It doesn't yeah. deny that yearning for, 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 for power, that yearning for certainty. Yeah. That kind of, uh, but also that need to surrender to pleasure, <laughs> to love. <laughs> Don't have a good week. Peace out. Let us know um, what we should review next. What we should review next? If you like the episode, tell us. Give us nice comments. Uh, satisfy us. Satisfy us. Intellectually. Sate us. Sate us. Um, yeah. Peace out.